I'm Jim Bradford. I'm uh, Dean here at the Owen Graduate School of Management, Mike, and I just want to welcome you to this uh, frank and discussion and interview. So thanks, thanks for coming. Appreciate you Glad being to be here. With you. Thank you. We're privileged today to have, I think, one of the real leaders in, in digital media and in publishing, uh, kind of the world of thought leadership and what's happening in business today. And so look forward to some of your responses, and I'll try to ask tough questions so that you'll enjoy the, that we'll all Good, enjoy the you. answer. Talk a little bit, if you would, you, you started out with word publishing, and, and I kind of don't know exactly how you migrated to where you are today. Talk a little bit. I think you've had something like 10 different positions since you started business out of Baylor. Uh, where have you gone and what have you done? Yeah, I actually started when I was a senior at Baylor at Word Publishing, which was a small religious publisher in Waco, Texas, okay. and started on the marketing side where so many people start, and it was a great background. I, I really learned the marketplace. Uh, then I moved over to the content creation side of the business into editorial. Mm -hmm. Came to work at Thomas Nelson in 1984 as uh, an editor, and uh, I soon after about two years thought I was smarter than the people I was working for, and went out and started my own business and quickly learned that I wasn't that smart. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned all the tough lessons that you learn when you go into business for yourself. Um, but I did that um, actually unsuccessfully at first and then successfully and then finally came back to Thomas Nelson in 1998 and um, ascended through the corporate uh, right. ranks and ultimately became CEO. So what were those first lessons you learned as that business failed? What was the failure? What did that teach you? Well, I think just the peril of arrogance. <laughs> you know, your early successes uh, can be your undoing later. Right. And so we grew enormously fast. But what I didn't understand really was the whole concept of working capital. Mm. And that you could be growing so fast that you're consuming your working capital, and while it looks good on the P&L, right. your cash flow dries up. So that was one of the tough lessons. Right. Cash is king, for sure. You talked about rising up through the Thomas Nelson. Talk about a little bit about first job at Thomas Nelson when you came back. What were you doing? When I came back, I was actually uh, kind of a second in command of a division. At that time, we had 14 different publishing divisions. And I didn't know this at the time, but I came into the division that was dead last in terms of every metric possible. <laughs> and oh, Which was actually great when my boss resigned two years later. Uh, because then I got to take the worst division and I knew I couldn't screw it up further. It was already beyond repair. Up looked good no matter what it was. <laughs> That's right. right. There's no, there was nothing I could do to hurt it. <laughs> and, and, then, and then from there you went beyond that division to do what? Yeah, well I, I, I took over that division and so uh, a lot of different things that we did in that division but we ended up going from 14th to 1st and actually much faster than I thought, maybe in about 18 months. So then I got rewarded with more responsibility and uh, so took on several other publishing divisions and ultimately took on uh, the president and COO role and then ultimately CEO. So how do you define the business of Thomas Nelson? What is that industry or what is that business? What do you do? We, we say we're in the business of producing uh, inspirational products. Uh, we don't really define it as strictly religious products, although we're the world's largest Christian publisher. But we say inspirational products because not every product is overtly uh, religious. So anything that inspires people, mm -hmm. motivates people, encourages people, uplifts them, we think there's a huge, vast market for that. And in the last, I guess, not just to, to your industry, but to the entire publication and, and uh, printed world and, I guess, digital, where we've seen this huge revolution take place, how is that affecting uh, you and, and your company? Well, fortunately for book publishers, we've been kind of last in the food chain. So I think it hit newspapers uh, the hardest and first, then it's hit magazines and now it's beginning to hit the, the book publishing industry. Uh, fortunately for us, the, the market hasn't been cornered like it was in the early days of music digitization where iTunes came in, kind of created order in a world of chaos. They were able to monetize it successfully and, and really control, what, 80% of the market. Uh, even though Amazon kind of got an early lead, We've got Apple and Google out there as well. Right. So we think all that competition's uh, great, but it, it's been honestly like surfing the tsunami. <laughs> and so what is it like to surf a tsunami? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I've done. Um, well, you, you definitely have to be agile. You know, the things that you think might work don't always work. The things that you are absolutely dead certain are going to work fail inexplicably. Right. 
And so you just have to be, be willing, to, even in a big company, to run it like it's a small company. Uh, I think we're living in a time when size is not a strategic advantage necessarily because right. in, the, in the early days you could get economies of scale, so if you were big, but now everything is, it's, it's so easy to uh, micro-manufacture, even like our book inventory, for example, we're able to get really small print runs. So the smaller we can keep thinking and the smaller we can be in our own minds in terms of how agile we are, the better. As you look at how your how how is your supply chain reacting to all this? Are they are they staying up with you? Are they ahead of you? Are you learning from them? And how do you use them? I, I, I think some of them we're learning from, particularly on the print side. Um, I mean, we've seen some amazing technological improvements. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Nelson, uh, back in the 19th century, we invented the rotary press, so oh, really? that that took printing to a whole new level. Right. And of course, we've come light years from that today, where the kinds of manufacturing that are being done or being proposed to be done uh, will revolutionize. I mean, printing one book at a time, right. printing two books at a time, black and white, four color, all of that. Plus digital that does away with all of it. Right. And of course, we're in the middle of all these format wars today where Amazon's got their proprietary format and Apple's got their own and Google, I'm sure, will have their own and everybody's got a little nuance. Uh, but we are definitely learning from some of our supply chain, particularly uh, Google, and Apple and the people that are on the digital side of it. Yeah, without naming names, I know you own some of that, uh, some of that viewable uh, material you read on airlines and those kinds of things. Uh, iPad, is that going to change us again? Is that going to be a, another revolution or is it just a new toy? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm an Apple fanboy. So let's start with that. I love everything <laughs> Apple. I buy everything Apple. Um, I kind of feel like it, and I actually wrote this on my blog, that the iPad was a little bit of a, a solution in search of a problem. You know, it's kind of that, that middle space between a right. phone and a laptop, and I always feel like, well, I need more power, so I'm going to use my laptop, or I really don't want to be clugging this thing around, so I just go ahead and use a phone. Right. So I don't know. I mean, I think, frankly, anything that gives competition to Amazon, who's one of our best customers, but I still think it's good. And Google has yet to sing. Yeah, I, I, and I, I realize they're going to do something. They've got a, then they've got a few coins to do that with, so it's probably they okay. Um, you talk about uh, being successful and failing some, and, and lessons learned from that. What are, what are the biggest issues you're facing right now as a leader? What do you what do you what do you think about? What keeps you up at night? We've had the usual things of the recession, but plus the tsunami from the digital part of it. Plus, I think there's a huge revolution in terms of the kinds of workers that we have to recruit today and what their expectations are of their work environment. T talk about that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I think Web 2.0, which sounds even a little passe to say it now, ha has really changed the way people expect to interact with their world. They want a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not content. Like when I was growing up and coming up through the ranks, it was much more hierarchical and dictatorial, mm -hmm. and the boss said it, and you know we did it that way. Right. And now the, the younger people that we recruit into the business, they want to have a voice. They want to work to accommodate their lifestyle. They actually want a life outside of work. That's hard to believe. I know, I can't surprising. Believe. <laughs> <laughs> so you've, you've blogged some on work-life balance. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Are you successful at that yourself? Uh, well, I'm successful because I failed so miserably at it. <laughs> um, I have five daughters, and you know it's 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 a great joy. And I've you know joked that I suffer from estrogen poisoning, <laughs> uh, but and, and there's some definitive markers of that which I won't get into. But but I do suffer from that. But you know, early in my career, and I think it's just the way that it works out when you're starting out, young family hugely demanding. Mm -hmm. Then you've got a job where you're really trying to make your mark and the right. boss is really demanding and it's hard to balance all that stuff. Yeah. And so what, I th what I've found is that I, I was forced to make some decisions and decisions that required courage at times, uh, decisions that sometimes I wasn't sure what the outcome come was going to be. Right. But I, I do think there's, there's no work-life balance without making decisions and without right. courage. Right. Can you give us an example of what you would consider a courageous decision where you stood up and said, this is the line, or I'm going to do this, even though there are other choices that I, I might have chosen differently. Yeah, I remember several years ago, uh, in fact, I had just become the divisional publisher. It was like my dream job. Yeah. And uh, I, I discovered that one of the books that we were about to publish, it was actually at the printers, had some material that I knew was going to be really objectionable to our audience. And so I went and visited with the author. She was unwilling to change it, and we had an enormous amount of money invested in this project. And I had to make the difficult decision that we weren't going to publish it. Right. 
And so when I went to my boss, he said, what, are you crazy? <laughs> he said, we got, I mean, do you know how much money we've got tied up in this? And it was over a million dollars. And I said, yes, I do. And so he said, well, I think you need to think about this long and hard. And so I did think about it over the weekend. I remember we lived on a farm at the time, and my wife and I went for a long walk, and she said, honey, you do what you need to do, what you feel is morally right, and I will support it. I don't care what the outcome was. And that gave me enormous courage. So I went in on Monday morning, and I said, look, I said, if you want to do this book, obviously you're free to do it, but I can't be part of it. And, uh, and, and so he kind of sat back on his chair, and he said, well, are you grandstanding? I mean, yeah. Is this, why is this such a big deal? And I said, it just is for me. I said, it would be compromising my moral convictions to mm -hmm. do this book. And so um, he said, well, you need to think about it. I went back to my office, and I, I literally thought I needed to start packing up. Fortunately, the CEO of the company, who was his boss, called me and said, tell me about this situation. I explained it. He said, I support you a thousand percent. Do it. Great. Good example. Uh, an example where you've maybe failed at doing that, where you've, have you, have you bypassed a decision you wish you could go back and revisit again? Has that happened to you? Well, there's been a lot of those uh, kinds of decisions. Um, you know, I tend not to remember those uh, <laughs> quite as well. Uh, we but, try to forget those. Yeah, things. exactly. <laughs> you know, you know I, they're never usually big moral issues, but right. they're the small compromises where maybe, uh, for example, I, I, I've had a hard time as an executive learning to trust my gut. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're, you're taught you need to be analytical, and so I kind of go through that drill. And honestly, so many times I know in my gut, like hiring somebody, that you just know it's not right, right. when you do it. Right. And so you go through all the analysis, the person comes on, it ends up not being good for them or for you or for the company. Right. I think I, I personally uh, have had the same experience, and mm. I think it's sometimes difficult to trust, but, but you should. You're, you're sort of a leader in the social media discussion area. I see lots of, uh, I've seen you speak at other places. I've seen you blog on this topic. Uh, we've had some frank discussions about this. What role does that play in your life as far as your business life, not, not social life, but your business life? What, what role does social media play and how do, you, how do you insert that into the business model of Thomas Nelson? Um, my board had the same question. Uh, you know, how does this fit? Is this just entertainment for you? Does it really fit? Right. Well, look, as a CEO, one of my main jobs is to get visibility for Thomas Nelson. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of an easier, uh, better way to do it with great leverage than social media. One of my jobs as a CEO is to network and to, uh, to connect with people that can help our business, right. help us move our objectives further along. Social media provides a wonderful venue for that. Uh, communication. You know, the largest trade magazine in our particular space has 20,000 subscribers. I have over 100,000 subscribers on my blog. Wow. So when we need to get a message out uh, to our industry, it's mm -hmm. much easier for me just to right. write it and control the message. Right. You talked about voice a little bit, and I know in, from an earlier discussion that when the, uh, I think Walmart stepped into the sort of the book uh, arena, did it not? And and you used the, that, some of that social media as a, as a voice in the industry. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I think part of the, the role of a thought leader is not necessarily to have all the answers. Uh, I certainly don't. But it's to be able to ask the right questions and the privilege of being able to lead the conversation. And uh, recently, uh, actually last Christmas, Walmart decided, along with Tar uh, Target, that they were going to match Amazon's online digital prices for physical books of $9.99 for their bestsellers. And I said, look, we've got to stop here and we've got to discuss this because I think it's devaluing content and let's have a conversation about it. Here's what I see. And I always try to leave my blogs open-ended and invite right. people to comment. And, you know, I get smarter when I listen. <laughs> and what did you learn from that? What, what was the voice? Well, I think, I think there's a variety of opinions. I think there are a lot of people that, that say, you know, and I, I tend to err on this side, is let customers speak. My complaint with Amazon is that they weren't letting customers speak. They were basically using our content to build their hard, hardware platform, but it was at our expense. And I don't really know what the market is willing to pay for a book. And I think that with Apple in the mix now and with Google to about to be in the mix, I think we'll find out. And I'm willing to submit to the sovereignty of the consumer, but I just want to know what they say. Right. We've, uh, we've watched um, the world change a little bit. I think a much more heightened... Um, examination of, of CEOs, what they're doing, how they're going about their business, uh, how they're going about the business of their company. Uh, social media, uh, 
is that impacted? Is that uh, given a brighter light on what you're doing personally? Yes. And how, how have you reacted to that? Well, it, the, the funny thing about it was in 2001, I wrote a book called The Invasion of Privacy, How to Protect Yourself in the Digital Age. I've completely repudiated everything I wrote in that book. Uh, because I, cause I really think you have to hide it in plain sight. You know, that the best way to, to, to deal in a transparent world is just be transparent. Let your life be authentic and, and let people look in. Because if they want to find out, they're going to find out. And so to me, it's given me a greater sense of accountability as a CEO. Mm -hmm. It's given me a greater opportunity to lead because I think that when people can see what a, a 360 view of a, a CEO looks like, from a social media perspective, it helps people learn. So you've, I embrace it. You've, uh, you're talking about 360s. You've used, I think, some professional coaches, if that's the right word. I yes. don't know. Some uh, Talk about the value of that and why you chose to go that direction. Well, I'm really committed to the concept of lifelong learning. Um, and I think if you want to get further, faster, the best way to do it is to hire the best coaches you can afford. Now, sometimes those coaches show up in books. Sometimes they show up in an MBA program. Sometimes they show up uh, at a conference. But I've used executive coaches really for the last, I guess, about 11 years. And actually, I came after that first year, I came off of Thomas Nelson with just a banner year, scared to death, <laughs> thinking to myself, how can I do this again? Right. And so that was the first time I hired a coach. I said, look, I have no idea how I did this and I need help if I'm going to go to the next level. Yeah. And that's been huge for me. I know the first time uh, I, uh, as a CEO, hit a set of numbers that were you know, really spectacular, you get to celebrate that about two nanoseconds. <laughs> so you exactly figure right. out that the next year you got to do it all over again, and it's got to exceed that last year's number. So that's always a kind of a, a surprise. Uh, from the coaches, did you learn more about yourself, or did you learn more about the world, or was it a combination? How did you, how did you use them to your benefit? Well, I think it was both. I think there was, uh, there was a, certainly a lot that I learned about strategic planning and organizational uh, development and behavior, but the, the best coaches I've had have been the ones that have helped get inside of my head and, and helped me see that the thinking, the, the thoughts that I have are what creates the outcomes in the world. And if I really want to change my organization, if I want to change the outcome, I've got to change my thinking. Have they helped you with the concept of ambiguity? You're, in a, you're in, obviously in a very changing industry right now. Have they helped you deal with that, that ambiguity of this industry? Yeah, I, I would say that the best coach I've ever had uh, was somebody that really taught me how to ask the right questions and, and to be able to be a learner and to really listen. Because I think when you're in a situation of ambiguity, you really do have to be listening. You know, you can pretend uh, and, you know, to be bold and really know what you're doing, but, you know, I think you're better off to assume a posture of humility and listen. Interesting. As you looked at this, this uh, industry, you talked about having a voice. You're, um, I, I would like to talk a little bit about maybe how you've influenced the industry from your point of view. How have you made this industry a different place than it was, say, five years ago? Hmm. Well, you know, I guess a, a couple things. One of the things I, I brought into question was the whole value of trade shows in our industry. And, you know, in some ways that this was a, a difficult thing for our industry. But I, my premise was that the ways that we used to connect when the industry was very fragmented, mm -hmm. uh, it was very economical to get the people together for a trade show. But at some point, we woke up and said, this is a very expensive way to get with our customers. And it's a very noisy way to get with our customers. So we pulled out of our major trade show. That was about uh, three years ago. And we really haven't looked back. It was a good decision. And other people, because of that, also had the courage to do the same thing. So if you want to influence something that you don't have control over as far as the direct command and control, it's not within the confines of Thomas Nelson, how do you go about that? How do you decide what avenues or what vehicles to use to have an influential voice in, in the industry? Well, I would say first and foremost, and this is kind of my whole philosophy of leadership, is that leaders have the privilege and the responsibility of going first. Uh, the most powerful way that anybody can, uh, can lead is by example. So whatever it is that you want others to do, do it yourself first and you'll replicate it in, in others. Uh, then I, I think there's also no substitute for being able to articulate those things well and to be able to communicate with the reasons, with the proper arguments, um, so that it's compelling. You talk about leading with purpose on your blogs. Tell us what that means. Well, I, I try to be very intentional about everything I do. 
uh, and that's what I mean by purpose, is have an intention. Because I think a lot of people drift um, mindlessly along without being fully awake, without being fully aware, and life just kind of happens as it shows up. And pretty soon they're in a job that they didn't want to be in. Uh, they're in a marriage they really didn't sign up for. Uh, their, their kids are at a, you know, they don't even know their kids anymore. And so I, I think you've got to be intentional. You've got to be purposeful. Uh, or or that's, that is what's going to happen to you. You're just going to drift along with whatever comes. Do you find the job you're in today very pressure uh, packed? Or you, do you feel that? Or have you found some way to escape that pressure? Well, I, I escape it by running. You know, you and I have talked about this, but just you're regular away, exercise. away from somebody, or you're just done? <laughs> yeah. Well, that <laughs> who's, too. <laughs> who's, cha who, who's chasing you right now? So. But, uh, but I do run. I do, I, I do believe really in physical fitness, and, and that's a, a healthy way to work off stress. And there's a lot of unhealthy ways to do it. But, yeah, I feel the pressure. You know, I mean, we've gone through in the last couple of years, we've laid off about 20% of our staff through this downturn in the economy. Uh, there have been many nights where I've laid awake at night uh, not knowing what I was going to do, what we were going to do, wondering if I was still going to have a job, wondering if my people were going to have a job, how they would feed their families, all that stuff. The, the great thing is, is I feel like it's like any other muscle you exercise. You know, I've, yeah. I've gotten a little better with it over time. Right. You know, I can hand, handle a different level of stress than I could. Just a couple more questions if I could, but one I wanted to ask, uh, really thought-provoking to me is, uh, we, we can be caught up, all of us, in the kind of the terror of the moment, the emails that are there every day, the, the little stuff of life. How do, you, how do you concentrate on the big stuff? I know you're a list keeper. What do you, how do you do that? Well, I think you've, you've got to, again, back to intention, there's got to be times when you unplug and get uh, in what, uh, I can't remember who wrote this, but it's called the alone zone. And I think that's an incredibly productive time, you know, when you can get the distractions out of the way, and there's so much that distracts us today. And really get focused on those uh, top priorities. So I make time for that once a quarter. In fact, my assistant asked me today, am I going to do this uh, this month? But uh, once a quarter, I get away for a day and a half. And I just review those things that corporately and personally are important to me. Hmm. And that's been successful for you? It's been very successful okay. for me. I want to ask a kind of a series of, of short questions, and these are not necessarily one-sentence answers, but they're, they're things that uh, lend themselves to short answers. Who taught you the most? I would say my last executive coach, Eileen. Your favorite leadership book? Well, besides the, the one you wrote. Yeah, no, <laughs> this, this, this may be predictable, but it, honestly, it's the Bible. Okay. Uh, what's your least favorite uh, leadership buzzword? Out of the box. Uh, your boss's biz, biggest complaint about you, if you have a boss now, I think it's the board, isn't it? Yeah, I think it would be the board. Um, you know, it's a, that's a little bit tougher one to, to answer, and I, I kind of had to go back to my predecessor, who mm -hmm. was really my, the one I related to the most, right. and I would say he would, would say I was too trusting. Okay. Uh, if you look at kind of where you, where you are today and where you're going in the future, uh, biggest ambition right now? I think my biggest ambition is just to create a company that creates remarkable products and people get to have a remarkable experience working at the company. And, and maybe a personal story, your biggest, uh, your wife's biggest complaint about you. <laughs> now you get personal. This is dangerous now. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I would say that her biggest complaint is that I'm not as available to her like on a Saturday to do kind of the chores around the house. And so I feel like she has to shoulder a lot of that on her own. One piece of advice you would leave us with to better ourselves, better our future? Well, I, th I think it would be this. Um, you're not as smart as you think you are. Okay. But you've got more potential than you could possibly imagine. And the secret from the one to the other is humility. If you'll be humble and learn, you'll get there and make a big dent. Michael, thank you so much. Thanks, really Jim. appreciate you being here.